uh, uh, good evening everybody uh, it's past 8 and welcome to today's episode of marvelous medicine the topic is mbbs teaching dead syllabus versus dynamic curriculum lighting a fire the speaker is uh, none other than professor ravi khan who's uh, the professor of surgery at sharda university in uttar pradesh he was previously the director of all india institute of medical sciences rishikesh uh, professor ravi khan did his mbbs and ms general surgery from king george's medical university lucknow of which he went on to become the vice chancellor he has done original work on lasers and breast cancer and has hundreds of publications and presentations to his credit Dr. Uh, Ravi Kant has been a member of the Medical Council of India and the president of the Indian Association Association of Surgical Oncology. He has received several awards, the most notable of them being the Dr. B. C. Roy Award in 2014 and the Padma Shri and Yash Bharati Award in 2016. He was part of the team which developed the competency-based undergraduate curriculum, and today he is with us to share how they came up with this uh, syllabus. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ravi Khan, for readily accepting our invitation and uh, being part of the marvelous medicine family. Moderating the session will be Professor Chetan Kantaria, Professor and Head in Charge of Liver Transplant Program, Department of Surgical Gastroenterology, Saint G S Medical College and K E M Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, Professor Chetan did his M B B S and M S General Surgery from University of Mumbai. after which he did his dnb surgical gastroenterology and a commonwealth uh, fellowship in hepatobiliary pancreatic and liver transplant surgery at birmingham uk he has scores of publications to his credit has written several book chapters and has given hundreds of talks all over the country he has been an eminent medical teacher anbai awardee thank you professor chetan kandaria for readily accepting our invitation Professor Anand Krishnan uh, does not need any introduction, and uh, Pratap Radha Krishna and me and many others in the audience are proud to be uh, his students. Uh, he is obviously a widely acclaimed surgeon and uh, um, medical educationist and uh, author par excellence. There is no topic under which he doesn't have a publication, including the as soon as the competency-based undergraduate curriculum uh, was supposed to be introduced, he he immediately wrote a. Uh, An article on that. He is a former professor and head of the Department of Surgery at Jipma Pondicherry, and he is a recipient of several awards. And he has been included in the Marcel Who's Who of the World and the Dictionary of International Biography UK for his outstanding contribution to science. Uh, professor Anand Krishnan started the competency-based postgraduate education at the Sri Balaji Vidya Peet, probably even before uh, the competency-based uh, undergraduate curriculum. Uh, came into focus, and he was also previously the dean of research in allied health sciences at the Balaji Vidya Peet. Professor Anand Krishnan has been a great um, supporter of uh, Learning Health Surgery uh, Facebook group as well as Marvelous Medicine, and has um, you know agreed to be part of several sessions. Thank you so much for your constant support, sir, and welcome. Thank you, Vidya. Over to you, Professor Ravi Kant. Uh, let me first uh, respectfully welcome Professor Nandi, who is like a real torch bearer for all of us. So, with your kind permission, Professor Nandi and Professor Nand Krishnan, who are the two, I mean, I would say most uh, look forward to stars, whom I have really, uh, I would say, worshipped almost. I'm a great admirer of Dr. Ravi Kant. So, great. And I worked with him, and he's a so, wonderful person. the key point in a medical education is when i read an article in canadian system that only outcome based curriculum will be done and nothing else it was more than two decades back it was around 2004 when i read that article that canadian uh, i would say accreditation has changed dramatically and you have to do what you are saying and that is what is to be examined so from then on we were working and there was a smriti rani ji was visiting and i presented uh, fairly 70 60% of this not not entirely that um, uh, why your medical uh, way of education she was hrd minister at that time that why your system has gone haywire and then i added another 40% much later so that is a cumulative work 
So um, I'm grateful to all the blessings of all the seniors. And I really, I would say what I am is because of a lot of goodwill and blessings. So here is the starting that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And obviously Yeats, this quotation tells you everything that the agenda is entirely different. Now we know that um, what is happening in this, oh, where is the upper part? Let me go. Okay, uh, somehow let me hide this part from there. So then I'll be able to, um, this vertical line is giving me trouble, okay. I handle that. So what Rizal says uh, that we don't have any Nobel laureate in medicine in India for quite some time. Even in a surgical field, Cocker and uh, maybe CABG, but not many uh, thing. So essentially too few patents and um, public health reform driven by bilateral agencies. So we see overall there is a pathetic <coughs> situation and this decision what is happening, ineffective, inefficient healthcare system, especially when you see what is happening in villages, when you see in districts, that you know, oh, this is the system which is going on, which is uh, unworkable. So it means something is wrong with the way we teach because the villages are starved, the district hospitals are starved, the CHCs are starved. It means whatever we are doing is not perfect. So problem is, what is the problem? Problem is physician of tomorrow are taught by teachers of today using curricula of yesterday. That is the main problem. That we are trying to use a very old established system for someone who will be handling tomorrow and we are not set. We, our, our mind is not set as to what we require. And therefore what we require is a continuum of the medical reforms. It, it cannot be a one-time business. It has to be on day-to-day -day business. Every hour you need a change. And the summary is very simple. If in three years, nothing has changed, it's a dead syllabus, it is a dead curriculum. So three years is ultimate, but um, you need every hour, you need to think something different. So what is the step one of the radical reforms? We often ask our doctors to go and tell the villages that infant mortality is higher, so change the white sheet, use a hand hygiene and all these things. And, and this is the protein you have to take. I think this should be shifted straight away to class one to five, hygiene, etiquettes, manners, basic of uh, nutrition. And therefore, affability has to be taught right from beginning as to instead of abusive language of the village, there must be something then and there in the school what is right because when you do become doctor, you already spent 18 years in your home and I can't change your affability index rapidly so that affective domain is taught, it's not so easy. And you say a significant road ahead to make a marked reduction in preventable and treatable deaths due to pneumonia and diarrhea simply by changing the curriculum of class one to five. We, we don't need high grade doctors to do that, which is a wastage of time. Early English classes to enable rural students to be at par with urban folks in communication skills. We may say anything, end of the day, you need a basic communication language. And we have got North, we have got South, we have got West, we have got East. And what is common everywhere is only English and not any other language, whatever may be our emotional factor. The communication language and shishtachar must be only from KG class and that they have to be taught then and there. We need a radical form step two, the six to 12th. Let's teach them at least human anatomy, human physiology, human biochemistry. Why a girl who gets married has no idea about a basic concept of her life, 
why a boy who is getting married has no concept of basic concept. So instead of teaching, I would say the frog and, and, and the earthworm and everything, let's teach human in a systematic manner and let's create a profound knowledge base. This will save time for clinical orientation in MBBS and professionalism has to be taught right from middle class. What is the dress code? What, how the shoes must shine? How the clothes must be there? How, how you should be personal grooming? They must be taught then and there instead of leaving us to do what we uh, nefariously call dragging. Uh, that should be avoided and we have to teach right from that phase, it should be done. Now the reform number step three, early clinical exposure. I will show you a diagram. This has been implemented for last two decades in Harvard, in medical schools in Europe, Indonesia, Nepal, everywhere. Who should teach anatomy? I have got a very serious difference of opinion on that. Anatomy must be taught only by surgeons and name of department anatomy must be changed to clinical anatomy. Physiology must be changed entirely by physicians and the name should be changed to clinical physiology. Biochemistry must be taught only by ICU experts and their <coughs> anesthetists and it should be called clinical biochemistry and we should, we should not go for basic thing. And this is the classical diagram. What is early clinical exposure? A mother who is Italian, the baby learns Italian language even when he is few months old. And when he's two years old, he talks fluent Italian. Same happens if the mother speaks Sanskrit or Tamil or Kannad or Uriya or Bengali or Hindi or um, Gujarati. That is what the child has. So why not our students learn basics right before they come to institution, right up to the first year, first day appearance. And our policy in KGMC was that first year student will be posted in emergency. Their job is nothing. They will write nothing, but they will assist the JR. So one student, one JR was the policy, and one each first year student will be attached to a JR as a, you can say, uh, assistant. Nothing will be done by him without his uh, approval, but he will see and absorb what is happening, and there will be a great learning time. So even means we need a change, a change required from lay person to student physician. It will provide an opportunity to know social relevance and contextualize, enhance student motivation, professional as to why I'm here. And passive observer will be converted to active observer, then actor in rehearsal, actor in performance. Radical reform step four will be a competency-based education as Professor Anand Krishnan has uh, started, but is not uniform in every center. We have to have the second point after the affability, ability is required. Now you have to, whatever you're saying, you have to see that it is performed, it is done. So focus on what learner should be able to do do yourself under my observation. And for this, I understand Northwestern Chicago University, where I spent one month only as a, I would say my summer vacation there in a clinical unit. That was the best. One student, one faculty rotation. There are 200 students. There are 500 clinical faculty. They are, so one student is posted only with one faculty. He moves with the unit. His name is on the OT list. He's the clerical number one. He's one who is making discharge. He's one doing everything. So a student learn how to do. And that Northwestern phenomena is now uniform Western world phenomena. Focus on technical skill. We need to have, similar to US, a central MBBS examination, a central postgraduate examination, central super specialty examination, a central nursing examination, a central paramedical examination. If we don't do this, then we'll be having island of excellence. The island of excellence may be Ames Rishikesh, maybe KGMU, maybe uh, Vidya Peet, but not many. 
the outstanding numbers are subpar and I would say uh, unhappy with whatever is happening there. There is a sole route to medical licensure must be a central examination system. You can name next, you can name anything that is different things. And having clinical skill exam using standardized patient and pure OSCE. I'm surprised most of the faculty doesn't know what is a OSCE. They would put a ECG and say, read that, this is OSCE, this is not OSCE. Anything used by brain is a very simple thing. That is a clinical vignette, but anything you by hand, that is a OSCE. And outstanding number of faculty members do not understand that doing by hand is OSCE, but doing by brain, what is the specimen? What is the finding? This is MCQ. This is clinical vignette. This is nothing to do with the OSCE that we have to understand. So it means changes in assessment program. This first line I have drawn from US Medical Education Board, which prepared for USMLE. It is the opening line when you see that thing. And you get many PDF as to how to prepare your teaching method and assessment method. Assessment drives learning. If your assessment is weak, assessment is weak, assessment is poor, assessment is inadequate, assessment is opportunistic, then your learning will have same drawbacks. So we need soft skill examination. We need a soft skill process. It means we have to work on all the three domains. We need to work on domain of cognitive learning, domain of psychometer learning, and also domain of, um, I would say, the soft skill, which is affected domain. Without the examination being split into three domains, in which individually you have to pass each domain. Because I, as an examiner of Royal College of Surgeons for MRCS and other examination, we see that who fails in the most of the soft skill? It is the Middle East and Far East people and Eastern uh, Asia not so much the Western Europe. Somewhere down the line, there, there is a problem. Step five, there must be mandatory family medicine training post MBBS. You cannot, you cannot with the MBBS degree, treat any patient either in UK or USA. You have to do either the family medicine in US or you have to do a GP course in UK. Without that, you can't treat anyone. If you have to go to super specialty or a specialty, then it is a very, very different course in UK and a very different concept in US. It means you need more time after that. The five years which we are giving is actually, we, we are not uh, covering completely. We are in hurry to push through, I would say certified Jhola Chap doctors. So medical graduates are largely unaware as this concept is not introduced. An independent and distinct medical specialty in developed countries such as US, Australia, Canada since 1960 had done this thing. So it means family medicine, if you want to treat the just BGP, then MBBS is not enough. You need to be trained in this thing, especially. Family medicine now is a thing which we need to encourage more and more so that the larger population at least get comprehensive health care for all ages. That is very important. And counterculture to rapid fragmentation of medical care into specialty and subspecialty. It is very interesting. Subspecialty word was introduced by Howard Dean when he was asked how you will name cardiology and other um, uh, what we call in India DMMCS program. He said subspecialty, not superspecialty. And that is, that is a classical word in America today. Step five, we have got DNB family medicine. We have got new AIMS like institution who are having CFM and we need to take a further mandatory post MBBS training as a step to you know, give foundation. And then I was presenting to the um, uh, government of UP in a government of UP seminar as to how to improve health services. My, my agenda was don't misuse MBBS. What I'm trying to say, if you want to run a hospital administration in terms of either it is a AC is working or the cleanliness is there or this is there, 
This is not the job of a doctor. This is the job of a health minister or MBA who has done in health administration. They should be employed, not the surgeons, not the super specialists, not the senior surgeons. And this must be mandatory so that you leave these very well qualified people to do what they are meant to do. Then I said, public health and education program. This is not the job of MBBS doctor. This is the job of master of public health. Let them be given, even if they are done BDS or whatever, let them do the MPH program. Let them run all the 15 national health program and let leave your MBBS and specialists away so that you can do something that is important. And third thing that was, let MSMD give only secondary care and DMMC doctors to provide only tertiary care, but not the first, and GP consultation or referral system should be employed. This is very important. I was very much focused on how the America does as a law. When my cousin was uh, having a baby delivery, either in America or in Australia, I saw normally it was by obstetric nurse. The doctor is not coming because there is a what you call is a protocol requirement. It means we need to understand that what is the basic need of community? It is skin diseases, uh, uncomplicated delivery, malnutrition, diarrhea, non-communicable diseases like bronchial asthma, hypertension, diabetes mellitus. Let it be done only by only only by nurse health practitioner. It has nothing to do with a routine doctor because that is what the problem is. And we saw, then we, we, we knew that there is a problem and we analyzed the data and, and published that, what is the advanced trauma care center for nurses, why we need that. And it is essential if you want to them to have anywhere. So then we realized a lot of prescriptions are not as far. And I started in KGMC, all the OPD prescriptions, 10 prescriptions were photocopied they were analyzed by me individually. And then I used to call the HOD as well the concerned faculty was written. And I used to say, which textbook support this? Just tell me that. And we realized that average, whatever we are screen, we screening only 10%, but out of the 10%, 75 prescriptions in a medical school are not as per textbook. There are too many extra unnecessary drugs being written. So there is a big catch and what is happening even under our own nose. So we realized that this is a very important thing. We must put a pharmacovigilance unit and it must be a mandatory check into the system as to what is happening. So we realized that nurse health practitioner is the way. Let them be given a big prescription writing facility. Let's change our laws and so that each and every village can be covered each and every CHC can be covered well and let the normal population, the poor population, the village population get hold of best of the uh, practices by this nurse health practitioner. So primary treatment of uh, bronchial asthma, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, dermatology, obstetrics should be only by qualified nurses who have done that qualified course. And this I think now is well established, is a well accepted system which should be done. So we, we launched a nurse health practitioner course and we also included so many other things which on our request were included in the system. So why medical education is poor in India? Now the next question is this, because our focus should be assessment drives education but we don't have a strategy for impartial machine-based assessment strategy. More often than not, 99% of faculty want a long question where they can give a arbitrary marks. So they don't have to prepare their mind in either preparing the question or marking. And the marking is very dependent on it is in the evening or morning when they are tired or not tired, after dinner, before dinner, and therefore we were having in Lucknow KGMC so many complaints that the SCST students are getting less marks, the OBC students are getting less marks. So we change a lot of questions to only clinical vignette, which is uh, read by machine, only computer will read it, and there'll be no bias. 
and that that was required. So assessment, once you get a strong assessment, it goes down the line to every student and they start learning. Now, next is why medical education is poor in India. Medical faculty may be good clinicians, whereas all are not. But maybe good clinician, I accept that point, but they are not good teachers in 90% of students. There are very few Professor S. Nandi. There are very few Professor Anand Krishnan. There are very few Professor um, R. P. Sai of Lucknow. So there are very few whom you can count in your 50 years life. If you count your one hand finishes all teachers, you can imagine that. That is my story. That is my own story. It means what is the solution? Now they must be trained on job. When someone teaches primary school, they do the B.Ed. Or, or they do some other courses, but we don't focus on that. So let's assume the medical faculty do not know how to teach. And that is a major, major catastrophe. Second, why it is poor? They resist revising their own theory topic style or content. What they were giving topic last year, they want to teach again second next year. And therefore the best answer is rotation of topics among faculty number one, and flip classes, which is a routine, 95% of classes in Middle East, especially in our objective competency-based curriculum are flip classes, and that is a routine. The lectures have, we must realize, only 5% retention power at five years. It is the lowest level of talk for education purpose. It, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So lectures should be abolished. We must find new ways how to teach. Why medical education is poor in India? Medical faculty resist upskilling. I saw immensely in Lucknow, it was a phenomenal resistance. But anyway, I was not either a pushover uh, because having been there, I know what is to be done. There must be mandatory courses for faculty for basic increment that you won't get in this increment without doing this course. No license to manage cases without ATLS, ACLS, EBM, medical photo. CME, when you are doing a CME, every session in Bahrain and everywhere, you have to answer. In US also now, you have to answer in every session. If your most of answers are wrong or you are not answered, then you don't get CME credit for that session. Now, this sort of strict monitoring in so-called CMA is, is also required. Why medical education poor is poor? Medical schools resist opening focused organ-based department. When we said, who is doing peripheral vascular surgery in uh, Lucknow? They said, we will do. I said, you are a cardiac surgeon. How many times you will come? He said, most of the time I will not come. That was the frank statement. So why not we open peripheral vascular department? Who will do thoracic surgery? Cardiothoracic and vascular surgery. They want to do only cardiac surgery. For them, thoracic is not a fact. Why not we open thoracic surgery? Similarly, everything which is required by the normal population, let's create a department for them. Only way uh, Professor Nandi knows, when we focused on periodic cardiac surgery department, there was a hue and cry. But I said, in this area, you have got CABG group. You have got other group. But nobody in Pura, Uttarakhand, Western UP, Haryana, Nepal is doing periodic cardiac surgery. Let's focus on that. So we have to understand what is the need of the society. Let's be, our wavelength should be with the poorest of the poor at the village level, know their problem and solve as the administrator. It means solution will be swing with the current, analyze need of population, evaluate international pattern, either modernize or die. Rating of the institution must be by number of courses offered in terms of organ specific treatment. I understand GI surgery is common, but now we have got a hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery. And I'm sure if we see the UK pattern of FRCS, now there is a FRCS, upper GI, there is a FRCS, lower GI. There will be a pro and con against them. But my answer is sweet uh, Finland answer. The Finland answer is anyone who operates on rectum will not operate anything else. Anyone who operates uh, anything else will not operate on rectum. That's the Finland dictum. So maybe 
in order to have excellence beyond what you call the international limit, so that even international patient will come to us when we are focusing so minutely and so much in detail. What is the another thing? The six-year course or assessment is not adequate. Let me first talk MBBS, then I'll talk MS. MS is three years, nowhere in what it is three years. It is in US six-year course. It is in uh, Middle East six-year course. So I consider GR and SR is a six-year course in India without year inadequate. Let's talk about MBBS. MBBS, most of the places is either six year or it is four plus four. The American model is four plus four. You do a college, then you come for four years. But otherwise everywhere else where you come after class 12, it is a six year course. What is the answer? How do we do that? When my daughter was giving exam, I realized, I asked her for license exam in US, how is your theory paper planned? She said, we have 2000 questions to answer in two days. Now we have to understand there cannot be a luck factor in the final exam. There must be every month, there must be a test which is purely objective machine read. And if you got four theory papers, it must be at least 200 each in theory paper. There must be nothing like a clinical, uh, there must be nothing like MCQ. The only term is clinical will. So another thing is we do not understand the basic needs of the population. Like psychiatry, so rampant problem, orthopedic, so much common, dermatology, so much common, ENT, so much common. So once we realize that in a US MLE, the psychiatry and other thing are good. 25% questions. We learn from that. When we see in the OPD, dermatology, a lot of people need dermatology help or orthopedic help. For all these four departments, we created a separate MBBS passing department. You have to pass these, they were independent. They were not much with either medicine or surgery or anything. So dermatology has a separate professional, ENT has separate professional, orthopedic has separate professional, psychiatry has separate professional. Everything was done that you have to pass this exam as a separate professional exam. So we, we did that and we published this also that psychiatry curriculum as a major subject during MBBS in India. It was the first time done there. And it was wonderful to see it was uh, accepted very well by the student well. So we created dermatology as a separate subject, orthopedics. So question is what should we do? My answer is too much clutter in examination, less declutter. Let's keep our mind clear as to who wants where. So we kept final year examination only surgery, medicine, periodic, and urban guide. And nothing else in the final year except these four. In fourth year, we kept psychiatry, orthopedics, ENT, dermatology, family meds. That you have to clear that, they will not be asked again. In third year, we can make sure PSM, clinical pathology, clinical microbiology, clinical pharma. I focused on this term clinical. I said, if you are asking basic pathology without relevance to patient, or basic microbiology without the relevance to patient, or pharmacology without relevance, it is a bad teaching. You have to have a applied teaching all the time. Then the second year, we created a forensic, clinical genetics, clinical ICU care, clinical basic ophthalmology, because they will not be operating, but they must know when it is to be operated, what drug to give or not. So in this way, the AIMS Delhi model for ophthalmology is a better model. So it means uh, we do not understand and first year exam is only clinical anatomy, clinical physiology and clinical biochemistry. And this was like, um, I would say cat in the pigeon game when I said the anatomist cannot teach anatomy well, the physiologist cannot teach physiology well, the biochemist cannot teach biochemistry well, because they are not teaching on the patient, they are teaching on the book. The book people forget, but patient we remember. So we have to change the standard that there is the applied thing in this thing we need to know that. And probably the Australian model in which there is no anatomy or physiology department in the university, that can be one, one lesson in the world. And when I was in Australia for quite some time, I, I was quite impressed 
that whole topic is to be taught by one who will do the job. It means we need to focus on early exposure. We need to focus on medical education because that will be teaching the, I would say, teachers who do not know and the faculty developer program, including sincere visits and honest visit abroad to learn new things will be a key factor. And they all were strengthened in a very big way. Eventually, uh, we changed the department, department of medical education because they were given the task of also teaching uh, administrative officer, clerks and nurses and paramedical. And therefore this name was changed in, in, a, in a different way. So reform curriculum designed and implemented by all department. What it will need is a vertical and horizontal at that time. When he's taking an anatomy class on head and neck, at the same time, we need someone who is talking about the clinical applications of it, the complications of it, whether the radiotherapy is required. It should be a comprehensive program and not isolated, uh, something like staccato firing. So what each topic we decided, we, uh, we did this in Middle East, we decided level one, two, three. That level one will be having 70% of question in your exam will be level one, must know. Level two will be desirable to know and level three will be nice to know or something rare. And we made sure that because there the passing uh, in MBBS was 60%. So we made sure that if you must know, then you pass but your distinction is not there till you touch nice to know and you land somewhere in between when desirable to know. So all question paper were in detail. Each question was marked level one, two, three. It was vetted by, uh, I would say peer group. And then it was put in exam. It, it was a very good uh, system. And I'm, I'm surprised that most of the teachers do not understand what is the Bloom's taxonomy. Pure knowledge means nothing. Now the Google uncle can tell you everything. The key point is whether the student can analyze the data, come to a synthesis, find out what is to be done in this patient. <laughs> we don't need too much data. The data and the knowledge is there in Google. The data is there in chat GPT. So in the more modern chat GPT, you will be requiring more of synthesis, analysis, evaluation, than a simple pure knowledge. So what it made the change? It made the change that clinical vignette based on pure knowledge, more than 10% we wrote them is a criminal crime, is a crime. If you write knowledge based question more than 10%, it is crime. So you have to have a good 80% question in synthesis analysis application and not on pure knowledge. And we made sure that because each exam was analyze multiple ways. We have to remember, student remember exam lifelong. Whatever is not asked is not read and no competency. And therefore we must have an exhaustive questioning basis. Pure recall question must be completely vetoed and must be considered as a crime. And assessment of knowledge by MCQs or clinical vignettes and skill by OSCE is a concept which takes so much time. In full one day course, which the Hong Kong professor was taking, it was very great difficulty to tease the teacher what is OSCE. It was not easy. We did another three year course by a British uh, professor who was teaching clinical vignettes, how to make. Everyone understood that they didn't know anything about uh, clinical vignettes so far in life. And therefore this concept comes from blueprinting. What is the blueprinting? Blueprinting means what is the outcome? First, you write that on your pen. Then you put this, put you in the center, in the center of the table, blueprinting what you want student to know. On the left, you write how you will teach. You will teach by lecture, you will teach by demonstration, you will teach by seminar, you will teach by handholding, you will teach by work, uh, clinical cases. On the right, you write how you will examine unless until a serious blueprinting of at least, at least 500 module in general surgery are done, I can assure you 
most of the college will be turning out, uh, I would say, fairly, fairly poor student, even if they got the distinction. So let's see what America does. And they are doing since 1990, uh, even from 1991, all MBBS also same thing. So PG, same thing, UG, same thing in America, irrespective whether you are learning in Harvard, Stanford, California, Texas, Florida, same system, same system being examined. That there will be cognitive is designed into three, patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning and improvement. And practice-based learning come more on a psychomotor uh, uh, domain. Then the, uh, your affective domain, they have given so much focus, the two lines, interpersonal and communication skill and professionalism. And when you combine all this, it is called system-based practice. So they teach, this is their goal, and this is they teach, and that is how they examine. So new and learning teaching method included means we need a class on thyroid anatomy must be attended by endocrinologist and by thyroid surgeon. Interactive teaching are required. Student-centric teaching is required. E-learning, digital library access, these all things are required. And classes for those with special needs. We relied in KGMC that there were 12 students who did not pass despite being in MBBS for 14 years. And I used to say in a very lightheaded mode that Ram Chandrika Vaswar, when was Khatam Ho Gaya, but they are not come back. They, they are not going back. It means those who are coming from either the reservation group or those who are coming from rural area, unable to cope up with the rapid English, which is Latinized, we need to create focus on them. Simply failing is not the idea. We have to support them. This is our duty. We are the guardian. This is our job. So let's see what is now done now. So here we are. Unless until he can do or shows how to do, knowing has no merit. It has no value. It is irrelevant. Your knowledge is completely irrelevant because now the Google and chat GPT will completely show this data. So test of knowledge, and you can see that how we do that. That is the way sometimes we make the blueprint as to what will be done. And these blueprint are so important that that is the way I will teach. That is the way I will examine. These are so important. Unless our fundamentals are clear, we are lost as a teacher without knowing that we don't know how to teach. Now we learned one thing, that assessment needs to be transparent. The formative assessment in America is close to 70% of total marks. Whereas in India, it is only 15%. And reason is our teachers are not honest. That is, a, that is I'm telling you, a frank submission by the agency which makes the rules that our teachers are not honest they will give more marks. So it means we are not honest and therefore formative assessment, which is the key way of learning by a constructive feedback is absent. Taking once a month viva and call it a, a unit test has no meaning. Every step must be examined. Every step must be scored. Summative determining level of competence for progression, ideally should have only 30%, but that is not so. In India, it is good 70% of marks. Blueprinting of syllabus, but in AIMS, we change that to 50-50. Blueprinting of syllabus, we have to teach the teacher what you want. Can you jot down on a paper, which they don't do? And appraisal must be a formal review of progress. So that is how the world moves, but we don't move that way. We don't move that way. None of this is applied in any of the departments, department meetings, staff council meetings. They, they, they don't do that. They, they find difficulty. So we, we understood that there is a dead syllabus if no change in three years. Actually, what happened is I was asking about what drug you will give if it is an ER receptor in 50 year plus. And we wanted answer only as an aromatase inhibitor. And anyone who was giving tamoxifen, we were not agreeing. 
So someone said, why are you asking latest thing? I said, see the syllabus. It is written, teach breast cancer. They didn't tell me that teach breast cancer as per 1960. I'm teaching as per 2010. So I will follow what is the latest. That is what, so syllabus must change. Curriculum must change. Teaching method must change. Assessment must change. Too much human independence on assessment strategy means complete failure. This will be failure. Using MCQ instead of clinical means you are, you are chosen a bad, bad strategy because that will be cognitive knowledge base. It will be a bad study. Why is assessment in India fail? We need central examination for UG, PG, super specialist, nurses, paramedical. So next is now a good step in the correct direction. Individual universities are so biased, so much driven by who is the local, uh, I would say like, I call them warlords in a private sector. They decide who will not be short of attendance and who will not fail, not the teachers. So you'll be surprised that uh, the universities have lost their local standee and they lost the prestige of that their results do not matter in real life. Licensing exam, again, I would impede by central pan-Indian authority is must for UG, PG and everyone. So opportunistic teaching breeds in company. If suppose one unit getting mainly uh, laparoscopic surgery, but you're not doing rectum, you're not doing stomach, you're not doing hepatobiliary, so you, you are not doing um, uh, head and neck. So how come your teaching is complete? Suppose one hospital is not getting enough patients. How does the America solve these things? There the program coordinator is the assistant professor. And he with the, uh, with the American board makes sure that the student goes to some other hospital. So the logbook which is decided by American board is filled. It means electronic logbook, which is managed by the central system, has to be completed by the local people, whether they go to one hospital or they go to 10, unless until that, that education system is poor and extremely poor. What I found is, uh, I use um, uh, one Hindi quote, you, and I'll tell you what the meaning in English. Jeshta se shreshta nahi hoti the seniors are not necessarily the best. And the moment you understand that, and I found especially in uh, KGMC as well in AIMS Rishikesh, the biggest stumbling blocks were not the deans, but the HODs. They were, uh, some of them were in surgical field. They were not operating. They were um, not doing any case. They were just writing their name in the OT list. And I verified by three independent sources that they were not there, uh, washed up even in that case. So you can see that HODs have become simply by seniority, a biggest bottleneck in reforms. On the contrary, program coordinator in USA is usually a stand professor. The chair only focuses on grants and future direction of the institution. They don't bother about who has come today, who has not come today, who's leave, who's not leave. That is not the job of chair. Somewhere we have to understand in Middle East, even assistant professor are usually HOD bypassing professor. So seniority is not a criteria of always reward in life. And what is the final problem with faculty? This is the way I thought. The main problem is they do not know that they do not know. That is the main problem. Most of them, what they think is so obsolete so outdated, so outrageous, that they are unable to come into the real world of this area. So we need a reform. We have to manage the same people who are with us. We can't get new people, and especially in the recruitment system. We need a vibrant faculty development program with workshops almost every month. We need to have multiple institutions abroad and in India who are supporting us in how to do we need board of studies. We made a law in AIMS Rishikesh that every department will have board of studies and minimum two international faculty will be member even if they are on Zoom. Doesn't matter, they have to come physical. So you must have idea as to what is happening in Canada, what is happening in US, what is happening in Singapore. 
and initiating of visiting faculty for initial international exposure of students. I was very keen that nurses should visit abroad, um, uh, the students should visit abroad, the students who are abroad must come to India and see what is happening and talk with them and then understand. And I'll give you on the last line, the real scenario. The Mac master student, around 18 of them were visiting Lakhau. And I called all the faculty to interview them. And I said, how you do your exam? He said, never long questions in life, only clinical vineyards. So the teachers were aghast and shocked because they were opposing me. Then I talked to another uh, student to talk to uh, Ghani faculty. And she was asked, how is your American training as a PGY-5? And when he gave a one hour lecture, they realized most of the lecturers were not doing what she's saying. Then I asked one intervention radiologist from California to talk to the radiologist and the surgery yeah. department. And I realized that our teachers are lost in a password so vibrant professional development program are required and we need a lot of intramural funding. We need a, a performance assessment. Can you imagine two of my senior teachers got angry by this thing, the last line? Because based on the student data, I gave them an advisory note that your performance is only 18% in terms of students by marking. And, and they got, uh, they, they took like a personal animity with me mm -hmm. on this point that why you written advisory note. So we did a lot of MOUs with various places and we made sure that workshop and training are phenomenally on each subject, faculty development, assessment, digital presentation, BLS, ACLS, basic airway course, advanced airway, evidence-based medicine, hand hygiene, uh, biological, this all waste management, occupational hazard, medical photography, fire safety, all these were done regularly in, in all, and they made sure that it was a pretty routine and it was a capacity building program for not only trauma and emergency in AIMS Rishikesh, but all over India. And the concept remains same. I am driving from Dibrugar to Trivindram. I'm driving from Dibrugar to Trivindram. I can get accident anywhere. Will I get a world-class treatment or not? Unless in everywhere on the pathway, the surgeons are trained in ATLS, I will not get the best of the treatment. So capacity building program is the key and we need to focus on them and make sure that all these courses are essential. And I would say curiosity is the king. The search budget we keep five lakh per project, you can get more than one project. And we kept a budget of five plus crore for intramural budget. And we keep uh, almost eight to 10 crore for library. And we made sure that research budget of one lakh per student is available for 100 students, which include nursing and paramedical. So we do some research. We call it summer school research. And we made sure that PubMed papers are published before you appear in MD, MS, MC, DM. And there'll be no increment for faculty without completing EBM course and other essential courses. No first salary for GR without completing EBM courses. No first salary for uh, nursing without completing EBM. And if you don't do this, we will block your movement anywhere. No salary, no travel support. And it was for everyone. Faculty, GR, SR, nursing officer. BLS, ATLS, ACLS, EBM. Only thing we changed was we put ACNS for nursing. Similarly, these four courses, medical photography, hand hygiene, fire safety, simulation school center, you don't complete that. You stay cooped in this uh, frog in the well. You can't move out of the Rishikesh at all. And similarly, these all these courses were mandatory. There were no option. So this was, can you imagine, was for my clerks and officers who are not doctors, that you have to do BLS, even my all drivers, all my personal attendants, everyone official, what you call as the ward boy, and uh, everyone has to do BLS and hygiene and fire safety. Then the modern term is publish or perish, and we know that patents are much better than publication. This remains. And therefore, I thought if there are no new ideas, it's a brain dead team. So we worked on remote monitoring work. We worked on circulating microRNA. 
and we made sure that uh, uh, you, you can say that if you do any staff council, academic council, the insistence on old pattern shows that it's a brain dead team. So ultimate aim is to support poor in society. And we did multiple works based on that, that ultimate aim. I, I call this as a Walton Dean uh, uh, message. In his first line was the curiosity and his last line was what you are doing is for society, that is the ultimate aim. So I would say education is not filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire and you can do it and it is a possibility and therefore I summarize, shift a lot of curriculum to class one to five primary school. Shift another curriculum to middle school, focus on them. Then make sure that it's a mother and baby syndrome right from first year and a student going to emergency and a robust assessment. Focus on a skill, focus what actually the OSCE is. And academic leadership is the clear you lead from the front by self. I was a, a course convener of UG and PD and Middle East. I was also the key person who was handling everything. So I knew what is to be done. I've been working 10 years abroad. So I had a fair good idea what I wanted because I wanted my institution to be at par with the best in the West. So we need skill, competence, sway of output and selected affirmative support. And uh, again, if you really want country to grow, let's do not misuse MBBS, utilize MBA, MHA for hospital, utilize MPH for public programs, for rural setting, you utilize nurse health practitioners and segregation of work, and only then we can think. So curriculum needs some major surgery every year, and in no case later than three years. Thank you, I'm sorry. I probably uh, went more than what I was supposed to go. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Avikan. So you really lit the fire in many of us who are listening to you today and hopefully many more who will be watching the recording. Um, over to you, Dr. Pantharia and uh, Professor Anand Krishnan. Uh, Dr. Nandi, would you like to say something, sir? Nandi is muted. You're muted, sir. You're muted, uh, Dr. Nandi. Am I unmuted? Yes, sir. Right, right, right. I think it was an excellent talk. There are two uh, points I would like to say. One is that you have um, set out a curriculum and pattern for excellent doctors. But since we have so many medical colleges, and I think that we should have two kinds of doctors. One is a competent doctor and was an excellent doctor. And, there's, and they have different courses. And I think the choice of medical students is very important, <clears throat> that they should all come for an interview. And I think just uh, reciting past knowledge is not the answer. You should ask people about their motivation and they should all have interviews. And secondly, I think we don't have enough carrot and stick. We don't have and this time-bound promotion for faculty is terrible. We should have, I was talking to Patrick Kamath from the Mayo Clinic, and every year they have assessment of faculty. And the faculty assessment should be all round. How much they teach, how much research, how much contribution to the hospital they give, and how much contribution to society. And I think not based on who they know, what influence they have, and time-bound promotion. That's all I have to say. But I think it was an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Dr. Chetan? Yeah. Uh, Professor Ravikant, sir, I really enjoyed your talk. I really agree to the fact that the change from should be from below onwards, what you below upwards what you said from uh, starting from kindergarten to the third MBBS level. But the most important thing which you stressed or rather could have stressed much more is that in order to bring about this change, it is very important that we uh, 
we train our present faculties they the change has to start with them because uh, we all agree that the faculties do not put in as much effort it should be put uh, they, they should be putting in uh, imparting a optimal medical education they should be uh, what you said was very right that the say they make the same presentation each time and many a times even in our cmes and conferences we see the standard presentation the same slides in fact you can predict what is going to come next so it should be dynamic it should be changing another important thing is that the faculties should themselves get assessed periodically by the students and uh, they uh, as you rightly said that you implemented this in kgmu that they should be told about uh, uh, what are their ratings and where their shortcomings are and how they can be uh, how they can improve themselves besides this many a times we see that the faculties do not give a honest feedback feedback is very important students should be given their feedback and that is what is going to bring in the change then uh, uh, i also like the point that the basic uh, basic science which you said the anatomy physiology biochemistry should be clinically relevant whether you name it as a clinical anatomy or not but it should be very much clinical relevant here in comes the role of integrated teaching where initially say for example topic of jaundice so the person your physiology person will teach or what is jaundice then the medical person then the biochemist will tell you what are the relevant investigations and surgeon will speak on the surgical part of the uh, 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 jaundice then faculties in i in uh, some time back there was a rule by all the uh, by, by all the medical councils of the state that they need to have a minimum cme points but which should be real means they should be giving those uh, uh, to earn their credit points they should be giving a uh, exam which is a must like they do in us you said that uh, there should be an organ based specialty i i, I really uh, i wonder how it is feasible in such a uh, setup like our country where we have various levels of medical colleges but yes it can be done in a tertiary medical care and i feel that the met course uh, which people are doing it by force so that you know it is a part of the mcr and uh, nmc it should be done more out of will and each and everybody should be do doing that in early uh, very early in their career when they are assistant professor and not just at the time of promotion which is uh, this so this is what i had to say thank you very much sir for an excellent talk <clears throat> let me let me answer this point by just two uh, small interjection before professor and krishnan that we did close to more than 150 courses for faculty each year number one so they were not small number they were big number of development program for faculty number two right from bari to everywhere i seen also in molanazad Portal hypertension, one hour for medicine, one hour for surgery, immediately after that. In Bahrain, it is same topic, four hours by different people. Same in Australia. So now this, therefore I use the term for this, we call horizontal and vertical integrated teaching. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Over to you, AK, sir. Thank you, Vidya, and thank you, Professor Ravikant. It's a wonderful talk. I enjoyed every minute of it, and uh, I'm sure the message that you were giving would have reached all our audience, and I hope it reaches everybody else who are responsible for making decisions in our country. There's very little that uh, I can uh, disagree with you, because I've been in this um, pedagogy training for the last 40 years, and uh, teacher for the last 50 years since I finished my MS in 1973. Now, the thing is, there are obstacles. And unless one considers those obstacles, the intention will often not translate into outcomes. That is the problem we have in our country, where targets are fixed. I do not know by whom or with what evidence. 
and they are forced upon the population for implementation. And I'll give you a simple example of the no system can produce a satisfactory outcome unless the input is also properly regulated. As uh, my teacher, Dr. Nandi was telling, the system of selection is so skewed that it has nothing to do with aptitude, interest, or motivation in pursuing medicine. And now with the mushrooming of uh, private medical colleges, which are in proportion far more than government colleges, with a lot of uh, money involved in fees, motivation has nothing to do with pursuing medical education. It is to, everything to do with affordability. And therefore, we start with a handicap. Secondly, and many of these mistakes are regulatory mistakes. And I'll tell you from 47 till 97, 50 years, we were having the two year basic science program and which was reduced to one and a half year basic science program. And as you rightly said, basic science, unless it is taught in conjunction with clinical medicine has no meaning because one has to learn it along with the application. Only in 97, for the first time, the preclinical program was reduced to one year and it created a huge furor in the country, you know, from teachers of basic sciences and it took a lot of time to calm them down. So that is one thing. Secondly, colleges which have facilities for training 100 suddenly found themselves having 250, although they did not really request it. And why did they have 250? Because in wisdom, the government had decided that we need to lower the ratio of doctors to patients from one is to 1,700 to one is to 1,000, irrespective of how it is done. So increase the number. Was there a simultaneous increase in the number of faculty? No. Was there an increase in the facilities? No. Was there uh, insistence on simulation pedagogy to overcome the shortage of clinical material? Vaguely, and it is not monitored at all. Therefore, we have sudden situation where almost the same number of teachers, in fact, many and the far fewer than what is listed for the inspection, because you and I know what happens in many instances, have to cope with 250 students. That's the first difficulty. In a small place like Pondicherry, where I live, with a population of 10 or 11 lakhs, we have two government medical colleges and eight private medical colleges, probably the highest density of medical colleges anywhere in the world in one city. So skewed distribution of medical colleges and improper selection as Dr. Nandi rightly pointed out. Thirdly, a very tight regulatory system, which is not participative, but prescriptive. I really do not know how this recent document of 2018 has evolved the competency-based medical education program. If you have seen those three volumes, they'll hinder you from reading them. There are three huge volumes of competencies, 2,884 competencies, which are except, uh, ex expected of a medical graduate. But if you read the list, it has nothing to do with the disease distribution in the country or the period of training they spend in different departments during the four and a half years of their medical course. I've written about this and I'll very briefly read. They have asked for skills to be developed and also have described which skills are to be certified. And I'll just read you the numbers and you will be amazed. Medicine has 506 competencies to be developed. Is there any program in the world which when faced with 250 students at a time in one batch can develop 506 competencies given the number of teachers who are actually working in the department? 
anatomy has 381 physiology the same duration but only 127 and then biochemistry 69 and so on and so forth and when you come to certifiable skills surgery which you would expect at least a few skills need to have be present in the patients. Chetan might agree with me. He and I are allied specialists. There's not even one certifiable skill in surgery required of an outgoing MBBS. Some 69 skills are required in pediatrics, a huge number and not a single certifiable skill, not even giving a medical certificate of a wound or a drunkenness certificate in forensic medicine. Now, that is the way the curriculum is prepared in our country, disseminated, compelled, and everybody has to follow it religiously with no scope for feedback. Can you then be surprised that the output quality is not satisfactory? Thirdly, as you rightly said, and uh, the IITs are classical examples, 100% internal assessment. And the students have 100% faith in that internal assessment. But here, we started with one third, then reduced to 20, and now it is even less than 20%. And the final examination is, is like a one-day match. You expect that to certify whether the student is competent or not competent, because formative evaluation, workplace-based assessment is non-existent in any of the medical colleges. So how can you ever ensure that these 2,884 competencies are developed in our students? For the first time in 2018, the regulatory agency thought that soft skills and attitude are important and they introduced the so-called 8COM module. And ATCON module is now the attitude, ethics, and communication module is compulsory and runs from a vertical thread right from the first year to the final year. But you read that ATCOM module and then you'll be surprised how is communication evaluated or how is professionalism to be evaluated by multiple choice questions. So this huge mismatch between intent and practice which exists in every part of the system has contributed to putting huge burden on the teaching community because they do not know where to go. Faculty development programs, the so-called basic and revised basic course which Chetan mentioned, is done more for completion rather than for producing any uh, attitude change. After all, what is required is attitude change in faculty so that they take their profession seriously and they put their heart and soul into training the medical students. So clerkship is probably the best form of learning medicine by working with a unit. That's what happens in the United States. You know that after the initial period of one year, the rest of the training is all by clerkship and rotation. Clerkship does not exist here. BCLS and ATLS, is not compulsory part of the curriculum. It is done where they have facilities where they have a good uh, simulation lab. Otherwise, it's not done. Or they pretend to do it without having proper facilities. So given all these backgrounds and uh, having nearly now, I think, 634 medical colleges in the country and producing some 90 odd uh, thousand students, I'm surprised the system is still working and the medical colleges continue to function. So in the context of that background, I am sure that the message you have given is very vital. The message has to go to every medical college, all, all 600 plus of them. But to enable the teachers to perform, it is necessary that the system accommodates their demands also by having the proper number of teachers, properly trained teachers, adequately motivated students whom they engage with, and a system of evaluation, not what we have now, a one-day cricket match, or sometimes a one-case cricket match, where your performance on one encounter decides your fate that day. Unless we do that, knowing what is to be done will not, is not going to change the system. 
and I hope we move from this very tight regulatory jail-like system that we have now to one which fosters innovation and fosters some independence and fosters experimentation so that we may have examples which can then set fire to the rest of the medical colleges, as you so rightly said. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to hear you. I enjoyed you, uh, Dr. Avikant, as I always do. So many forums I've heard, and uh, we have been uh, together in some forums. So oh, the system has to be taken by its neck and shaken, and then only the quality of students will improve. And uh, I'm not cynical, I'm not pessimistic, I'm just being realistic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Vidya, Dr. Vidya, I would just uh, give one small uh, point to Prof. Anand's uh, view. At COM module as a pilot, we started in 2014 in KGMC. And after I insisted that this uh, COMS will be, we used to call COMS as a short term for affected domain the comms will be mandatory component. So we started, we were the first one by MCI to start at com there. As far as the students are concerned, um, I'm, I'm happy to share that Northwestern University of Chicago always had a 200 student bundle, always. But the key point is they had a 600 around faculty, clinical faculty, I'm not talking non-clinical faculty. So the one student rotation with one clinical faculty was the norm there. So I mean, they, they found the answer to how to train the numbers. If I see the Egyptian model, they take 1000 students in one place where they teach anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and then they send to 100 per hospital in different places. They, they don't stay there and, and they teach. I think um, my point is, Things are possible uh, when any application for leave used to come to me, even a casual leave or uh, on leave, I would say, have you done ATLS? Have you done ACLS? Not, not approved. So we made sure that you have to rub your nose to do it or you are not going to get away from it. AIMS Nishike is not being under the regulatory authority, uh, gave us two ambitions. Number one, AIMS Delhi is not my ultimate aim. That is rule number one. The ultimate aim is best in the world. And let's do whatever I have seen over 12 years of working abroad as to best in the world and let's implement through hard nose method. So grateful. Thank you. Get well, well said. Thank you. But we need to go a long way because uh, we have the intentions. Flip classrooms you mentioned, flip classrooms will work where the students are motivated enough to read the material and come prepared to the class so that the clarification part can take place there. So, when uh, whatever material you give to the students is untouched till they reach the class because they're so used to be spoon fed, then flipped classrooms don't work. Sir, I will answer that point by a simple one, my own analogy of eight years working. Yes. A Filipino, uh, my PA would give to all the students what topic they have to do and they have to come and get it checked by me or by any other faculty before they do. There were 100 marks scoring on that presentation. That will go straight into their internal assessment, which included AB presentation, their uh, discussion with the senior, new topic, depth topic, interaction with the audience, and all those points. And if you don't do that, your internal marks are automatically reduced. So it was by force. And it was eight years successful model. Every student there had a laptop. Tango uh, is the most, uh, what should I say, most fired about pedagogy as far as learning general surgery uh, group is concerned. So I'm sure he's bursting with questions. Uh, over to you, Ilango. You're muted. You're muted, Ilango. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Professor Ravikant, it was a wonderful lecture. I enjoyed every bit of it. Um, I do have some questions uh, and some disagreements, um, but I think you can clarify them for them. So I uh, I recently started teaching a bunch of MBBS students who have actually passed out of college for struggling with their NEED PG. They are not great performing students. 
what I learned was that um, I had to use different, different methods to help them out. So during that work, I recognized that pure recall questions you cannot throw out. It is like uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I agree that OSCEs and um, clinical vignettes are the most important methods, but the base recall, I think I had to layer it. So what I have done is, first, they have to know the fact. They have to interpret the fact from basic information. They have to interpret the fact and apply to another step. And the last one, which I'm currently experimenting, is adding noise, things which are worthless and of no value. Uh, if you add them with noise and without noise, the student must be able to filter out the right information through the noise and provide uh, provide an appropriate answer. The, the third part was exam for examiners. Uh, one of the difficulties I faced as a student was that the examiner can ask any kind of question they like, even if they do not know the answer. And uh, that is something which I still feel exists. So constant faculty, I mean, it's not appropriate for the student to assess the faculty uh, just like that, but there must be a central standardized method for assessing the competency of the medical teacher on a regular basis, just like a relicensing examination, which will actually make the system fair because it's very easy to ask questions from uh, one side of the table and expect the student to answer them. They, they actually may not be. Uh, in that, in that, the definition of must know, nice to know, uh, were nice actually, but for the individual components, we still have to write. When, when we look at the next examination, the must know facts are still not completely listed. Once it is listed, probably it will be easier for us to teach students. Uh, the last one is, um, is about, is, is that when I read your, uh, read, the, read the document on the MBBS curriculum, I felt that, uh, they were probably goals. So in that, I actually disagree with Professor Ananda Krishnan that uh, the goals were have to be set in stone, uh, probably, like you said, no, you can have to change everything else. But the tools are still open for experimentation. That actually, once I understood that, I, I was free to experiment with whatever models I find useful to the students. So uh, currently, in the last three, four days, I'm teaching them uh, GI surgery and uh, trauma. So I they have to do some work at home. They come back to the, uh, I work in a private hospital. So they come at four o'clock when I finish my clinical work and they still, and I, on, on a daily basis, I tell them which tool to use to actually solve the questions. So there is still a method for in, in implementation. Uh, the, there must be a method. The, the last one I wanted to say was, uh, there must be a way to, to address knowledge attrition. None of us actually, have great memory or uh, great skills, but we do them by constant repetition. There is no system for knowledge attrition correction in our country at present. There is no relicensing examination. Uh, your idea about uh, a proper examination in a CME is great, but can we centralize that so that the competency at the, the for the clinical delivery of care at the patient's bedside will be on par with the Western countries? These are my questions and thoughts. Thank you. So let, me, let, me answer, let me answer Sorry. a few points, uh, Langos, please, uh, Dr. Lango, that what we, I, I'm an intercollegiate examiner for the Royal Colleges. So what we do is before we can examine either the OSCE or the practical, we undergo a course for the examiners, number one. Even in the examinations for uh, three or four of us, or 10 of us, there is an observer of the examiners who scores independently two things, what the student should have scored and how we are doing the examination. So both things are important. And we are trained as to how to answer on each exit or anywhere and what we should not ask or what we should do. These all are courses for the examiners. Number two, regarding uh, cognitive, I will never ask what is the serum potassium normal level. I will ask his level is two, something, what should I do? I will ask serum calcium is 7.3. Should I give calcium or not? And if they do not answer, that I'll check for albumin and I'll check for um, other things to complete or a free ionic, then I will not give, it may be normal. So it will, it, they have to answer my way. 
they, they know their option. Regarding your need, I can tell you, we always keep in a two hour class, last 10 minutes are only examination question which will be asked from this. We make sure that 10 minutes are only for the next examination what we do. About relicensing, uh, in America, first five years is by a CME, but next five years after 10 years, you have to do relicensing. On the continuous learning easy way, my suggestion is Medscape um, CME is a very easy method to learn. It's uh, easy to do and you get certificate after that on what happens and you can do continuously upgrading your knowledge. Thank you, uh, Language Chief, welcome. Uh, we have Dr. Amit Ghosh uh, uh, from the Mayo Clinic, who's also very much interested in pedagogy. And in fact, he was the first speaker of our Marvelous Medicine series. Uh, Ghosh, your comments and any questions to the speaker? Yeah, I mean, this is an amazing talk by Dr. Ravi Kant. In a lot of ways, it was like the gold standard of what should be done. But what Dr. A.K. mentioned it, what is being done. You know, the frustration of being a medical student in India, uh, even from the best institution and coming to abroad and then going back, is that you're never considered MBBS as anything. So however much curricular change we are making, when I was in Chandigarh uh, doing my MD in medicine, the patients from Kashmir, Srinagar would come who would have a 10th grade education. They would like to see a DM doctor and not me. So it all forced us to all do DM. Uh, Indian students perform excellently in exams. So they get very high USMLE scores, but in US we will not take them until unless we are aware of their clerkship. So except probably All India Institute, none of the, of Delhi, none of the All India Institutes are considered as anything here. None of the other places are considered until unless they can show, demonstrate that they have all the other scope which we, which we demonstrated. Having said that, any Indian who makes it to an American institution or a UK administration in the higher education perform excellently well. And like Dr. Khan said, we all have numerous of these student awards and all that. So what is the change? And the change which cannot translate uh, into fusion is what exactly Dr. A.K. mentioned. And that's why I said what Dr. Ravi Khan said is a gold standard. It can be done in one institution like Rishikesh or King George. But whenever you use a stick technique of education, like you do not do this, you don't get your clinical leave or this leave, it will not work. In America, they'll get rid of somebody like Dr. Ravi Khan very fast here. Uh, within a year, he'll be done. Uh, so that is, the, that is in fact the reality. And I'm sure in India also, they will do that. So the whole change of the utopian view of what medicine should be and how it should be done and who should be running it has been a debate for ages. But it needs somebody of great intelligence, of great leadership like Dr. Ravi Kant and Dr. A.K. to take all the heat and to go day in, day out, regardless of their poor pay, poor recognition, lots of uh, uh, abuses from their faculty member to keep pushing this agenda. I'll end up by saying uh, a story uh, which I heard uh, that actually made me write. There's an article on USMLE I've, I've submitted to an Indian journal. There's a lot of article on education I've published in Japi and others. But there was an accident in um, Darjeeling uh, where there was, a, there was a train which had, had, was full of passengers and they had an accident. And they figured out that the maximum damage was uh, with the first two bogies of the train, including the steam engine. So they had a big meeting and they produced a 3000 page document as to how to prevent such accidents. And the nutshell, the summary page, which was one page was said that none of these accidents should happen. In future, um, we should never have the first two bogies of any train because we found out that the maximum death happens in the first two bogies. And if the first two bogies were to be happening, they should be in the last, uh, they should be <laughs> at the end of the long train so that there is no accident. So, a lot of our theory happens like that. The main challenge is, is the government listening to you? What you talked about, Dr. Kant, is called the social determinants of health. Now, poor medical student has to figure out not only language, but what the mother-student relationship is between every 1.3 billion population of the country. 
uh, where nobody else has any right over it except the student has to do. So there's a lot of pressure on a student. Everybody wants to do their own curriculum adjustment and why they're good and why they're bad. So that is causing a lot of problem. In US, we take away all the, it's a dictatorship rule. Uh, the curriculum is decided by few people. They're all assistant professor to others. And they laid down the rule and all the professors, everybody is held accountable. So whenever you have all this ego thing coming up, I am such and such, I'm a Padma Shri, a Padma Bhushan professor, you got to listen to me, it will not work. Here we do not care. That's the only difference I found out, who you are, what you are, respectfully. If you don't change, you will be removed from the seat and somebody else will come. That's how things are done here. It's very brutal. Um, right now it's a pass and fail in USMLE part one. So what we have done is we have changed we have put lots of clinical care because these students are only studying for USMLE one and we were giving them time. Now it's because it's gone, so now clinical care. So you have to be flexible. How are you going to bring this change in India? Uh, and who is going to bring this change? Is it going to be noise making? Is it going to be shaking the curriculum? Because I can tell you there are a lot of brilliant people in India who know what the actual curriculum should be. But the implementation is so difficult which Dr. AK said. So I'll end with that. I know it's um, rattling the cage, but that's how it is. Can I make uh, two points, Vidya, if you have time? Yeah, absolutely, sir. Yeah, just three points which arise out of what Ilangu said and uh, Professor Vikant's talk. The first thing which Ilangu said, they had stated goals. The list in the NMC document are not goals, uh, Ilangu. They are not competencies, certainly. Some of them are intent statements of intent objectives. Some are long answer questions. A few are competencies and some are actually just bland statements. So it's very poorly written. Unless the outcomes are clear and the expected level of achievement required to graduate is clear, the teachers cannot implement that list as it is stated. Secondly, the teaching learning methods are all prescriptive there for every one of those 2,884, they tell you how you should teach, with what subjects you have to integrate. Even if you do not have facilities for integration, you have shortage of teachers in the allied, you have to do it because that is the requirement and that is uh, how it happens. And my last point, and I promise with you, I won't open my mouth again. <laughs> and the thing is, if you standardize the outcome by having the next examination, without standardizing the intake or standardizing the teaching learning process in every college, not in Ames Rishikesh, not in Ames Delhi, not in Jipmer, then there will be a huge backlog of students who would have completed the program but will not qualify for registration because they do not pass the next exam. So before implementing that, my request is please, please, please standardize intake standardized teaching learning process before you bring a national exit test and then have 50% of the 90,000 people who complete the course not able to pass, not able to find a job. They cannot be registered. They cannot start internship. What will happen to them? Has anybody thought of that before we rush into this next program? Dr. Amit, thank you for your comments. I would just uh... Recall my earlier visit to Mayo Clinic in 2000, where I, um, in a way, observer to Dr. Wang in medical gastroenterology on um, photodynamic therapy protocol and and the Raman effect of virtual biopsy protocol. My one of my junior is working uh, in colorectal, probably there, Dr. Jay Bikchandani. And another gentleman who was my postgraduate in Malazad has moved to now Texas as a transplant surgeon. So do the Malanian also do go there? So that is another point I just wanted to say. It's not entirely zero for others. The MAMC has done pretty well. Apart from KGMC, huge number is in America. A huge number KGMC group is in America. So they're doing well. My, my way of telling that about I will not approve was my way of communicating to you, but is done in a different way. There are one obligatory meets, there are one which are discretionary. So the discretionary will not be given if you have not done that. 
obligatory will be allowed automatically that doesn't need my approval that the dean approves so probably i need a small bit of clarification anyway i enjoyed working eight years in um, as a top seat and i can say that whatever we wanted be implemented with full government backup and approval and solid backing right up to the top of the minister and chief minister in lucknow chief minister and governor in uh, there by the top of the minister uh, we had no problem in implementing so thank you uh, thank you sir uh, this uh, session wouldn't have been possible uh, without uh, uh, punidhar suggesting uh, this uh, topic and also uh, introducing uh, me to professor ravikant and uh, liaising between us so uh, punit uh, did the session uh, live up to your expectations thanks a lot vidya Uh, i think i'm i'm so glad, thrilled that uh, it's such a success and uh, i think it set all of us thinking uh, that's exactly was the purpose of this whole pedagogy series uh, was really lango and uh, i think i'd like to just share one uh, thing that i learned from dr avikant which i've actually in the process of implementation and that is actually in the testing part you know his uh, he had a fantastic suggestion that you know we have this whole system of marking and assessing Uh, so what he wa wanted was that you know let's say we have an mcq exam of uh, 100 questions so the first time round the kids do that and they get you know get 70% so uh, that remains his marks assessment but he two weeks later he's asked to study and he takes the 30 questions again and you know there's a series of three so that so the whole idea is to make sure that he reads what is deficient so i thought that was a very good idea which we should implement uh, you know because we are always looking at exotic stuff to ask uh, what history what you know some uh, uh, stuff like that but uh, i think it should be what we really want the kids to know that message we must give reinforce and i think when uh, one of the points he raised in the talk also is when they're doing it in the middle of an exam i think all of us have you know even when we had the uh, session on the uh, 100th episode a lot of the seniors also said that they remember exactly what happened in their exams so i think that lesson is going to stay with them for a lifetime so i think we should use the exam also as a learning uh, process rather than only purely as a uh, as an assessment tool so a pleasure to see you of course sir, again uh, you know in in person almost if not in person but uh, uh, we were there through covid times together uh, and and i i think i learned a lot in rishikesh Uh, including medical humanities which you already has a session on uh, earlier in this marvelous medicine thank you thank you punit let me let me clarify vidya ji what um, uh, punit is saying we said you appeared in your uh, exam and you got 54% marks so that is your mark sheet but that is not your degree now with 54% you have done 46% wrong so now i will give you a book and i will give you 15 days i will give you these question you answer remaining 46% and then i'll give you the degree so the degree will be for 100% but the mark will be for 54% and we want we implemented that that your mark sheet and your degree when you go there you know 100% although your mark sheet reflects only 54% which was on that day as is the country system not my system so open book examination is another philosophy which we need to implement and another thing which we learned abroad was a progress test they will do around 2000 question test in first year student will score around 3 to 4% they will do same test in second year and they will do every year till sixth year same same exam no change same questions and see how much each year the result has improved and that is called the progress test that shows how the teaching is being done so it's a wonderful i'm i'm grateful to puneet to connect connect and i'm thankful to uh, professor nandi and professor anand for the blessings and i appreciate uh, dr amit kamen but luckily i survived the system and implemented whatever you wanted without much of acrimony but small acrimony is welcome for my nature as a surgeon <laughs> we have dr dinesh kumar who is the dean academic of aims uh, jammu dr dinesh would you like to say something uh, thank you i hope wonderful to 
We are not able to catch your voice, sir. Can you hear me now? Better, better, sir. I, I thought it was uh, wonderful to hear uh, the eminent person's uh, voice. Can't hear. Can't hear, sir. Can't hear. So we'll, we'll, we'll be glad to see you as well. At least we can understand what you're saying. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Holding a headphone, please hold the mic closer to your mouth, sir. We're not able to hear you well. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. So, I said it was wonderful to hear the Ramji's eminent person talking about uh, where we are in terms of activities of our sector. And since we are also thinking in terms of that uh, the curriculum changes are the same. All the new so that not a simple address or anything. Pretty wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we're really sorry we haven't been able to hear you that well, sir. Uh, the uh, uh, the principal of uh, KMC uh, Warangal is also logged in. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, sir. Anyone? Hello. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, good, yeah. evening. good evening, ma'am. So it's a very nice talk and uh, uh, for the new curriculum. But we are facing a lot of problems in uh, implementing, madam. Because as you sir said very clearly, the number of students are increased from 100 to 250, and the number of faculty are not increased proportionately. And uh, and we have a small lecture halls also where we are not able to accommodate 250 members also. And uh, so um, infrastructure, much infrastructure problems are there, as a, because it's a government medical college. So slowly we are trying to implement the curriculum. So it needs a lot of uh, uh, training for the faculty also to, to participate I mean, uh, understand the curriculum first and uh, uh, implement the competencies and uh, small group discussion and self-direct learning. So it's a good, good initiative, madam. So we'll try to cope up and try to train our students uh, if possible. Madam. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much for to joining. My, to, my, to my friends from Warangal, please remember your juniors and seniors get teaching experience. They are faculty for them. So count them as your faculty and not as anything less than that. Because the real data, when you give experience certificate to them for teaching, they are also faculty. So your faculty, your JR, SR, demonstrator, everyone is faculty. Yes, sir. Right, sir. And uh, we are conducting also the revised basic course workshops frequently every three months and we're training all the faculty uh, for the new curriculum, sir. Uh, uh, the meeting is open. Any one of you who wrote comments on the... Go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, so in, in, any of, of you who had uh, put messages in the chat, uh, Please feel free to unmute yourself and speak now. Uh, meanwhile, over to you, Radha Krishna. No, I, I should say it's a wonderful session, and uh, I mean, was Ravi Kant is so inspirational, and every every single sentence and slide is a revelation to many of us, uh, especially uh, school education, middle school education, and how uh, uh, every year of MBBS the pattern has to change. But I have only one thing, uh, one worry is how can this talk be taken to the 600 odd medical colleges, uh, the administrators, the deans, and how uh, they all can benefit from it. One And second uh, point I want to make about uh, Dr. AK's comment on uh, regulation of input. I don't know if um, Jains like Dr. Ravikant and Dr. AK couldn't influence uh, the powers to be to uh, work on that aspect. Who else will? I do not know. Who will listen to uh, uh, this uh, rumbling saying that the input is so much and something somebody has to put a stop to it? Who should do it if not for Dr. Ravikant and Dr. AK? And why they have not done it or not doing it? 
Dr. Radha Krishna, my answer is very simple. In any medical school, 10 to 20% will be exported. In AIMS, 70% are exported. In MEMC, 40% are exported. In KDMC, 30% are exported abroad. Now we remaining group. In remaining, another 20 to 30% will become faculty or specialist. But overwhelming 60 to 60, 70% will remain in India at the GP level. So even if they are a bit less than optimum, it is better than nothing. So this is not the time to insist on the initial because we first we want the base to be filled up. Let's focus on the top, who will be the teachers, who will be specialists, but the base will remain shaky for quite some time till your data of how many for 1,000 patients, for 10,000 patients, how many doctors are there, till that data is complete. We cannot think because we have got socio-economic issues. We have got reservation, we have got uh, politics which is based on caste, and these are facts of the country. And the facts of country cannot be denied. So let's not meddle into that. Let's keep the 70% for Hoi um, Poloi, and uh, let's keep 20% for faculty and specialists, and let's keep 10% for export model. So uh, what I used to teach in MMC, my 10% lecture was for export model. That's why I'm teaching college studies. I'll tell them definitely that CCK ejection fraction will be there. But for 20%, I'll talk about um, CT um, uh, um, uh, cholangiography. But for remaining 70%, it will be ultrasound and old what was done and not done today. So we have to, we are teaching a wider group in the same class. Sir, thank you. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, uh, I would like to thank Professor Ravi Kant once again for uh, not only just accepting, but for his enthusiasm and planning. He sent me his slides just in case the slides didn't open so you can see how much uh, attention to detail he has and the enthusiasm for even relatively unknown uh, platform so thank you so much sir uh, thank you dr anand krishnan for readily accepting to join and uh, dr chetan i'm sure you had a busy day but uh, despite that uh, uh, you readily agreed and joined and uh, thank you uh, Thank Ghosh for always uh, actively participating in all uh, these pedagogy sessions. Um, thank uh, Professor Rajaram. Uh, uh, would you like to say something, sir? So your mic is muted. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Vidya. I think uh, I have nothing much to add because I did not hear completely what Professor Ravi Khan's uh, lecture. But one thing in the last day, what Radha Krishna said is how to build the cat. That is very important. Even I don't think my teacher, AK, who is here, I say he's my teacher because I was his student in the National uh -huh. Teachers Faculty. And <laughs> he, <laughs> he even cannot do this thing because the Indian situation is so bad. We tried in our own way so many things. What ultimately comes down is a motivated teacher. A teacher must be motivated. He must be uh, devoted for teaching. Only then the, our, this thing will change. Nothing much to add uh, this thing and convey my best wishes to everyone. Thank you. Uh, sir, only thing I presented what we implemented, not in air. That's all I would say. We implemented whatever we have said. In, in black and white, in real life, and uh, in both institutions, so uh, there, there's a lot of top guns need to be top guns. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone, once again, for joining and making it such an interactive session. Uh, we'll meet again next week with uh, yet another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Uh, till then, take care and stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Happy, thank you. Happy, Happy seniors. Happy seniors. Happy seniors. Thank you so much.